Welcome to Porch Play Chat, sponsored by the American Association for Promoting the Child's Right to Play, or more affectionately named IPA USA. IPA USA is the USA affiliate of the International Play Association. As part of our efforts to promote play, we're happy to introduce our Porch Play Chats. And these are conversations that focus on a wide range of topics from experts that are just as passionate about play as we are. You can find the latest Porch Play Chats and learn more about IPA USA by visiting our website at ipausa.org. Up in that top right-hand corner, you can link to our Facebook page, our Instagram account, and our YouTube channel. I'm Deb Lawrence, and I'm the president of IPA USA, and with me on the porch is Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Hi, nice to see you again. Um, Lisa's a board member. We're so lucky to have her, and of course, a, a person who is just as passionate about play as I am, and we are. And with us is Sarah Toussaint, and Sarah is the founder and director of a nature-based early childhood program in Stowe, Vermont, and they have... Um, Sarah, you'll have to remind me, but I think you have two locations, one for infants and toddlers and one for preschoolers and kindergartners. We do, yes. And a total of about 100 students yeah. and 20 teachers, mm -hmm. which sounds like an amazing ratio. Yeah. Um, and so Sarah's here to talk to us about building a nature-based early childhood program in Vermont, but I'm hoping you'll be more general and talk us how the world did you do it? because I want to do one at my community college. We are right in a forest. Oh, neat. Um, and we have talked about it, but I haven't quite gotten my administration there yet. So, yeah. so you're off. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so we are a nature-based program, which essentially means we spend the majority of our time outside. So um, it looks different with every age group, um, but our preschoolers and kindergarten and school age children spend the most time outside every day. Um, but nothing ever holds us back. We're outside regardless of the weather. So raining, snowing, ice, mud. We have something in Vermont called stick season, which is just when before the snow falls, when it's just frozen and cold. Um, so there's really never a day that we don't go outside. Um, and a lot of our curriculum is um, impacted by nature and what's around us. So, you know, what materials we're playing with in the classroom, you know, what we're learning about um, our curriculum is always being connected back to what's happening outside. So um, our goal is, is usually 75% of our time outside. During the winter months in Vermont, so January, February, those months, it's more like 50%. Um, with our infants and our toddlers, it's a little bit less than that. But with our preschoolers, we try to aim for 50% of, of our day outside. Um, if it's below 20 degrees, then that's more of a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, but we really try to push ourselves to, to be outside as much as possible. Um, so and we I, bring our curriculum outside with us too. So a lot of our math, a lot of our writing, reading, all of it happens outside. I really like how you have that blended approach. So some people, when they hear forest schools, they think I, I'm outside 20 uh, for a hundred percent of the day. And other ones sometimes are only out. If it's a five day program, they may only only go into the forest for a couple of hours, three days a week. And so right. it's, it's really interesting. There's a variety of ways to do that. Lisa. Yeah. I was going to say the continuum that I've acknowledged, I wrote about it in, in my own book about, you know, there's, there's, first of all, I think it, it need to be noted that you don't need a forest to take a page from what Sarah is sharing with oh, us today, go. right? You there don't need go. a forest to implement the oh. spirit behind a forest school mentality. And, and I like to say that, like what you were saying, Deb, some forest schools are more forest school inspired in that they might still have a, a brick and mortar building, but they spend a considerable amount of their day outside, but they still have that building ranging all the way to the end where, you know, you drop your three-year-old at the trailhead with a canteen and a machete and you're like, I'll see you at noon, you know, and it's like, woo. And, and it's funny when I've, I've shared that with people kind of half-heartedly, not, not sarcastically, but kind of in, in jest. And how many people in the audience of the workshop have been like, 
I would have loved going to that school. I would have, I would have actually shown up if that <laughs> was my school. And, yeah. and, and I want you to address any response that you have to what I just said, but also Sarah, something you, you kind of plopped out of, tell me about bringing the parents, what's the onboarding of the, of the families? What's that look yeah. like to you? Um, so the process of being a nature-based program, I mean, ideally one day we will have the space and we will be a program where you can just drop off outside and we don't really go inside much. Um, but the steps to get there, you know, we're still, we're still working our way towards there. So I, I opened the school, it's been 10 years. And so it has been a process getting parents on board, finding teachers that are bought into this philosophy um, and really building a program that supports this idea that being outside is, it's good for children. It's, you know, it's where they belong and they learn best. And when they have this space and they have the freedom to move and, you know, and all of the, um, all of the nature to be around, they they do better, you know, than being confined in the classroom and having to, you know, limit how many children per center. It's just the learning when you see that it's just amazing. Um, but to teach others about that and to get them to believe you is very difficult. And that's been the, the biggest hurdle for me over the years is, is convincing parents that this is a good idea and teaching the teachers how to do this well. Um, and how to do it right. And to, to really appreciate that time outside with children. Um, and so it's, it's taken a long time um, and a lot of conversations. We do a lot of our, um, a lot of our professional development is around our comfort level and what we can do differently and how we can do better and how much more time we can spend outside. Um, there, there is some professional development out there that's geared towards this, but it's, it doesn't really support the process of, of building a program that is nature-based. Um, they'll teach you how to you know, create games with matching leaves to trees, but they won't talk about the after. So we're a full day, full year program. So we're open seven to 5.30 Monday through Friday. When we go outside in the afternoons, you know, after we have a nap and a snack, we're outside for that last three hours of the day. So that three hour chunk with children can be a long time when it's 20 degrees outside. Mm -hmm. So how do you make that an engaging, fun time for children? Um, and how do you have teachers that are invested in that as well? Um, so to get parents on board with this, it's taken a lot of education. So we've, we've had a lot of um, you know, nights for parents to come in and learn about nature-based education. We've done a couple book groups um, we've, we've shared articles. We have a weekly blog that we write um, and share with families every week. And um, we do a lot of, we reference a lot of articles. We, we share a lot of research. Um, we, we document what the children are doing and share that with families. And um, we, those are all the different, yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, I think that's very important, especially when, especially when you're perhaps um, on the cutting edge of a new idea that yeah. you sh you're able to show that it's not just your personal preference, right? It's mm -hmm. not just what Sarah and her colleagues wanted to do because we were bored in Vermont. So, cool. you know, like, so this is what we're going to do. But there's evidence that shows yeah. that this is in the highest and best interest of our children. And I love right. how you kind of casually slid in there that being that outside is where they belong. They do so much better. We all have noticed there's, we don't have behavioral issues when we're outside. And if we do, it's so easy to address them. And it's so easy to allow children to take space and play independently or find another peer to play with and just give each other the room that they need. It's, it just makes such a difference. And, and yes, I, there are many times that I've said, this is, I, I'm not crazy. I, I don't do this because I think it's just, a great idea. I do because it's based on research and it's good for children. And I strongly well, talk that. a little bit more about, again, you, you, you're sliding these nuggets in there. <laughs> the, the, the behavior problems. Now I don't know your background. So were you ever in a space as a preschool teacher, an educator, a caregiver, a provider where you saw perhaps environments that were 
contributing to what we call behavior problems, but we know they're not behavior problems, um, but because they're environmental problems. Mm -hmm. and, and can you speak a little bit to like, what is actually different? So I actually, my background, I have my bachelor's degree in psychology um, and my master's in early childhood special ed. And now I'm working on a master's in early childhood leadership and administration. So I previously worked for the state of Vermont um, in children's integrated services in early childhood and family mental health. So I worked with families whose children had behavioral issues. I worked as a consultant in childcare programs and centers, helping them work through behavioral issues, social, emotional issues, that sort of thing. And um, it was in that work that I realized I needed to open my own school. I just, I couldn't watch it happen anymore. I couldn't watch children in the classroom struggle to get through their day because they weren't given the opportunities they had outside for were for 20 minutes in the morning. And it was on a playground that I, there was one program where I would go, you know, two hours a week. And if there were rocks on the playground, the teacher would, would scoop them up and take them out before the children got there. Um, and I could just see the children needing the time outside and the freedom to move and play. And it's just, when you, can't be outside and you have to be in the classroom as a teacher you have to control so much more than you want to otherwise it becomes mayhem you know when the when the regulation is 35 square feet per child there's not a whole lot of space for these kids to explore so it was in that work that i realized it's it's us causing the problems we have to create better environments for children so they have the space and they have the room to grow and for teachers to give them that space. You know, as a teacher, you want children to explore and to play and make their own independent decisions, but you need to have the room to do that. Do that. So, uh, sorry, Deb. That's okay. Sit down, Go Deb. ahead. <laughs> um, <laughs> Last time I had to say, it's my turn. <laughs> yeah, no, she, yeah, she'll do that in about two minutes. So. <laughs> Um, I was doing a lot of work, in, of course, pre-COVID up in Canada and a lot of forest schools, a lot of nature-based programming. And what I always loved about them, well, I love a lot of things about them, but their reg the, the licensing entity actually said, hey, what? Hey, look, guess what, guys? We need to modify our regs because you cannot, to what you just said, which is why I'm springboarding, yeah. of... You, you've you got a, a, a thousand acres <laughs> and, and how are we going to regulate how many toilets there are, right? Because then how many early childhood people, at least here in the United States, are going to listen and watch us and be like, oh, it's 25 square foot per child, uh, one kid per 50, or no, excuse me, 15 kids per one toilet, you know, and all of that. Like how... Are you able to to uh, to talk to that a little bit? The, so it's the been yes, and it's you don't have a lot of there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of push and pull. So we meet all of our licensing regulations here in our building. We meet all of them. You know, we have plenty of toilets, plenty of hand washing sinks. We have in the summer months we have a porta potty outside right next to our playground, um, and. We do, we do have those regulations that say, you know, you have to keep children protected from the elements. So our, our licensing regs changed recently in the past few years, whereas previously you couldn't go outside under, I don't know, 15 degrees or something like that. But it's recently changed now to, we are supposed to try and follow the recommended standards from the national, I can't remember what it's, the national, there's this weather chart that we're supposed to look at. And and the extreme hazard is, is a red zone. Um, but the key point, and I had a very lengthy conversation with a licensor one day, the key point that I took away is that we need to keep them protected from hazards. So what we have done, we have a four page handout we give to families when they enroll in our program and explains when we go outside and what we need from them to bring into school and how to what layers to send during what seasons of the year and how to dress their child. So during the winter months, our children come to school every day in their long underwear. That's their first layer. They all have wool. They're not allowed to wear cotton layers. They, they cannot have cotton socks. They have waterproof mittens that are fleece lined for our rainy days. Um, and we layer them up and we have boxes and boxes of extra clothes here at school too. So for those children that don't have it, we have it here. Um, 
And for, we also, we've developed a program. It's um, a separate program from our school, but it's a reuse clothing shop. Mm -hmm. And it's an online shop where people donate things. We buy things from Europe when at the end of the season for really cheap, you know, 75% off. And we sell it to families at a reduced rate so that they can afford to have the right clothing. And if they can't afford it, we just give it to them. So, um, and we have families that donate things back and we recycle it through. And so the clothing for us is the biggest piece. When it's 40 degrees and sleeting outside, we're still out there, but the children have, you know, they wool base layers on then they have a fleece layer and then they have, then they have a snowsuit and then they have rubber rain pants that go on top. Mm -hmm. So when the licensor comes and says, what are you doing outside? It's, you know, it's 15 degrees out. You say, look at the way this child is dressed and look at the way that they're playing. And for us as teachers, we have come to say, okay, yes, it, it might be five degrees outside, but let's follow the children. If they're uncomfortable, if they're crying and saying I'm cold, then we bring them in. But if they're outside and they want to play and they're comfortable and they're all we can see are their eyes, then we're staying outside. Um, so we really pay attention to how the children feel and you know, what they're telling us. And you know, 90% of the time they're happy. And Sarah, one of the things that I think is so important about what you just said is you're, you're letting the children regulate mm -hmm. when, a, instead of you telling them, oh, we're too cold because the teacher's too cold, right? right. <laughs> because she only has on like a windbreaker, <laughs> right? <laughs> and she's like, Boo, I'm cold. We're all going in. They're like, get a sweater, Sally. <laughs> <laughs> What are you doing? And we, you know, we have we have extra layers for teachers too. No, oh, there you go. Good. Perfect. Because I used to have that. Uh, sorry, Deb. I had a, a teacher who, when I had my child care center in Rochester, she convinced all the other teachers that there was a weather line that you had to call <laughs> to find out if you were allowed to go outside that day. And I found I can't, I can't believe I'm saying this while we're we're recording. But anyway, um, she was calling her mother. There's no weather. There was no weather line. There was like, there was. She did not want to go outside, and so she convinced everybody. And I was like, "How did you not think that this was not going to come back to me? That this is what you were doing?" That, yeah, no, go. If I and and to what Deb just said, I'm going to repeat it. I love that you're allowing the children to mm -hmm. say, "You know what? There's ten of us here." And uh, eight of us are really cold. And so we voted and um, we, we want to go in. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and so we do, we pay attention to the children and we figure it out. And the teachers too are really good at, you know, if they are noticing a lull in play, like what can we do to motivate these children? What can we do to support them? And so in the afternoons for that three hour block that we're outside, um, before pickup, you know, the teachers will come in on really cold days and they'll make tea in the kitchen and they'll bring that out. And so we'll have a tea break or, you know, they'll, they'll turn on music and they'll have a dance party, something like that, just to get them moving because they know that that's going to make the biggest difference to keep them warm and keep them comfortable as, as moving and, and being engaged in something together. So that's you guys something eat outside, fun. like, do you make a fire? Talk to, so yeah. fire is a fire is an interesting one. And our, our teachers, that's something that our teachers have wanted to do a lot. Um, and I, they're currently working on it. So we don't have, we're kind of right in the middle, middle of the village of Stowe. It's a small town, but we don't have a ton of space. And so that's been a, a big challenge for us. Like I wish we had acres and acres of land to go play on, but we're right in the middle of the village. We have a couple playgrounds here on site. We have an outdoor classroom we've made that's um, just down the hill and that's on our property. Um, but we really only have about two acres to play with here. So for us to have a fire and Stowe, the town of Stowe that we're in, they have really strict rules about fire. Um, so, and one of our parents is the, the fire chief. Oh. <laughs> so we so uh, probably get an exemption. <laughs> yeah, right. So we have a couple teachers that are working on a fire safety plan. And so um, they have, they're meeting with the fire department, they have contacted licensing and they're working on a plan to where they can have it, when they can have the fires and what are the safety pieces that they have to have in place for that. 
So I mean, certainly um, there are people in the village who have fire pits. Couldn't we just do a fire pit? We well, but everybody has to have a permit in our little town. It's very <sighs> strict. So, um, and this would be the first one given to a child care center. Oh. Some of Vermont, it doesn't matter. Ooh, and you can do precedent you setting. Oh, I love precedent setting. Exactly. We love precedent so, setting. Yeah. It's, it's still is a, it's a strict town and we have to follow and uh, we will, we'll follow the rules and mm -hmm. you know, do things the right way. But mm -hmm. yeah, definitely something that our teachers are interested in. Sarah, one of the things that I saw on the website, and I just wanted to hug you when I saw it. <laughs> was in the infant and toddler program, the babies on the grass. I was oh. like, oh. Yeah. Oh, just. A lot of time outside with the babies. Oh, so can you talk more about spending time outside with babies? Yeah. Because lots exactly. of people think outside with babies is the little cart where you can put, strap yeah. them in the straw. Oh my God. No, and no. I go, that's not outside. That <laughs> so yeah, our infants. Our infants and toddlers spend a lot of their time outside. And I think that's why by preschool, they're just, they're used to it. And they have no problem being outside for the majority of their day. So we take our, our youngest infants outside. And typically our infants start around 12 weeks. Um, and we have a playground that is really just for our infants. And so half of it is grass. And then half of it is kind of bare root and a little bit of dirt and a little bit of sand. Um, and so, you know, we lay them right on the grass. And usually a teacher with our youngest ones, um, we'll have a teacher that kind of sits with a few of them and just lets them explore and play. Mm -hmm. um, in the winter, we usually bundle them in snowsuits. Um, and we also have, we have these really great little bassinets with handles that are insulated. So we'll take them outside in those on the really cold days so that, you know, if they can't move, then they're in that bassinet. So they don't have to, they don't, they're not touching the ground. Um, so, so they're insulated from that. So when I was, um, I'm, this is my second marriage, but my first marriage, we were in Germany. Okay. And so, uh, and we were there for three years and we were in Bremerhaven, which is right on the North Sea. Mm -hmm. So it sleeted, not snowed, it sleeted. It was really cold, right? And I loved the German people's approach to weather. Because those babies were in those strollers and they were all bundled up and their yeah. cheeks were bright, bright red. <laughs> but they were they were experiencing it wasn't like, oh, it's too cold to take the babies out. We won't take them out. Oh, and and, and so do you do you give parents some of that wonderful thick bunting? I don't even know what it was called, but it was amazing cold weather things for infants. Yeah, we have um, we have a lot of different things. So we use wool blankets, we use down suits. And then, like I said, we have those bassinets that are insulated and they're kind of like a little carrier. Mm -hmm. So um, they'll take naps outside in those. Oh, wow. um, yeah, and it's just, it's wonderful. And we don't, we don't really use strollers and go on walks with our infants. Um, we really just uh, give them some time outside. Oh my um, goodness. When I saw that summer, baby, when I saw that baby on the grass, I was like, I just want to fly to Vermont and hug you. <laughs> they love it. And of I have to say that's been, do. the infants with parents has been, it, it has been difficult convincing parents that it's okay. Mm -hmm. But once you show them the level of care we take and mm -hmm. all of the different pieces that are involved in making sure these children are comfortable and safe, then they understand. And once they come and they see a sleeping infant outside on a snowy day, it's, you just can't argue with that. They and and can you imagine happy. just watching, even even if it's snowy, just watching the snowflakes fall and watching mm -hmm. the, the flakes fall on the ground and the babies just must be enthralled by that. They love it. Or just oh, being cool. under a tree and watching the branches move. Mm -hmm. Instead of a mechanical you know, mobile, mobile. Have that. It's just, it's so wonderful and it's so good for them. So Lisa, the one piece you missed that I want to, I, because you don't want to hug Sarah too, is that <laughs> oh, I already did. I saw her website. Okay. In the, <laughs> in the alumni or Right. I know From Champlain Champagne alumni Champagne are the best, Texas, right? <laughs> Champlain College, if anybody wants a grad program um, in early childhood. Uh, so anyway, uh, it, she they take the babies out in these insulated carriers when it's like snowing. Like in Mandalorian? 
kind, <laughs> not a metal one. No. Not the egg? No. <laughs> not the egg. <laughs> flies behind <laughs> her. <laughs> How it's awesome like, would that be? Let's make that. I, let's do make that. Let's but it's like that. a little basket and they let the babies take their naps outside in the winter. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's awesome. And that's been happening for so many years. And so I'm loving that her school is showing that it can still happen, mm -hmm. right? It can still happen okay. even here in the U S yeah. It's okay. Babies have been sleeping outside for eons. Yeah. They do so much better. Their naps are so good outside. Well, yeah. I think napping I, and sorry, I'm, I'm dodging the sundial again for our, our frequent viewers. But when you're outside all the time, running, mm -hmm. jumping, climbing, all the verbs, all my favorite verbs, spinning, rolling, screaming, throwing, yep. you get tired. Yeah. So when you're tired, let's be real. It doesn't matter if you're inside or outside. If you're tired, you're going to lay down and take a nap. Yep. Right. So it, in theory, it really doesn't matter if you're inside, outside. I love, there was a article that got posted a hundred years ago. I don't remember where I saw it, but it was a, a, a like an old school pram. Like, I don't know who still uses a pram and yep. it, it, and it was on like ice and snow. You could tell it was a very wintry yeah. environment. And the article was about how children are fully able to sleep outside, even if it's cold, which, you know, and I think there's room here to acknowledge that sometimes conversations like this, um, unfortunately get taken out of context. Mm -hmm. Like we're not like just rolling the prams out into the blizzard and be like, na night, you know, yeah. like, See ya. like, and that might sound silly or exagger exaggerated, but I, I think there's room to acknowledge that, that that's not what we're, we're doing. Right. Our program is outside. We're hanging out outside. We're eating outside. We're sleeping outside. Mm -hmm. um, we're not just, you know, okay, go to bed. And that the children have proper layers and they're properly yeah, dressed to course, be out of there. Course. But it's not yeah. like I listen to this. I watch this, you know, porch play chat and the crazy lady yeah. said that it's okay for my kids to sleep outside. So I go, you know, Without you know, what I've learned is that it all takes, it takes a lot of, of research and um, decision-making to make it work right. Talk to me a little bit about how you onboard your staff to get on board with this. Um, so a lot of it happens during the interview. They need to know firsthand that they're going to be outside regardless of the weather. And so we talk about that. We talk about the expectation and how much time they'll be spending outside and kind of, you know, I give them a list of the expectations. So whether it's an, an afternoon assistant teacher that comes in and is part of that, you know, outside time with them, or it's a, a full-time lead preschool teacher. And so that's a big part of the job description. It's a big part of the interview and what we talk about. Um, and if it's somebody that new to early, um, early ed or new to nature-based education, then we have a whole slew of, of articles, books, and um, online trainings that we have them go through. And so they kind of spend that first six months learning about all the different pieces. So they read David Sobel's book. Um, they read No Such Thing as Bad Weather. Um, and they kind of, they are paired with a teacher that's really comfortable with our our philosophy and our curriculum. And so they kind of follow along and get, you know, learn as they go that way too. Um, but what I do is our teachers, we have about half and half of our teachers, our lead teachers are half have their degree in education. The other half have their degrees in some sort of science. So what we have one teacher with a degree in sustainable um, ecology. We have another one with her degree in marine biology. We have another one with her degree, what is it? It's, um, it's um, I wanna say, I don't know, some sort of biology, but they all, they have, so they themselves are so excited when they see the fungus on the tree and they talk to the kids about what kind of fungus it is and, and where it came from and all these different things. Like the other day we went on a walk well, it was a, a couple months ago, we went on a walk on a nature trail in town and I learned about the little holes in a tree and what kind of bird makes those holes. And they're, they're you know, in specific lines as they go through and eat all the bugs in the tree. And so, because she went to college for this, has such an excitement for that information and the children just soak it up. 
Oh my um, goodness. And they know they, you know, they take their field guides with them and they know how to look things up in their field guides. They know where the section is on animal tracks. So when they're going out in the snow, they take their field guide, they find the animal track section and they try to match it up. They know where the wildflower section is. And then when they find a flower, they don't know, they look it up and they work together to figure out what it is. And tell so me, that, tell me, tell me an amazing, well, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> Tell me a story about somebody who maybe at the interview, you weren't quite sure, but they turned into like, yes, they yeah. belong here. Um, I have, I have a couple, I guess. Um, I have one that she, she kind of had just graduated from college with a degree in psychology and had worked at a summer camp and was like, oh, this sounds cool and came on board. Um, and at first just kind of was, a little bit shocked. <laughs> so she was, she started, she's been with us, I want to say four years now. Yeah, just about four years. Um, and she has her master's now and she's outside every day. That girl, she has, she has every layer you could ever imagine. And she is outside right in the snow with them every day. I never thought I'd ever see the day, but she, she got, she got into it. I, you know, when I hired her, I was kind of, I really needed an afternoon teacher. I really did. And she just, she thought, oh, this is kind of like summer camp. It'll be cool. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Until Ver Vermont <laughs> you know? winters. <laughs> yeah. We'll see how this goes. And she, she learned quickly. And a lot of it does have to do with the relationship between the teachers. When they see another teacher involved, you know, invested in the play and enjoying themselves with the children, then they understand and they get it, you know, just, I mean, I go sledding with the children almost every day. Like you have to love it. And then other teachers will learn from that and they'll love it too. And that's what the parents see. And that's why they know, okay, I get it. They're outside and it's 10 degrees, but look at them. They're enjoying themselves. My child comes home happy and can identify deer tracks in the snow. Like, okay, I get it. And that's, you know, if we're enjoying ourselves and we love what we do and the children are responding well to that, then we know we're doing something right. And that's when, that's when we know we have the right teacher because there really isn't a, a good set of criteria to check off when interviewing somebody for this job. Mm -hmm. No, because everybody gives good interview. Mm -hmm. right. 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 And they can say, oh yeah, I'd love to play outside. So it's, it's the true testament is one of those 30 degree days where it's sleeting outside and we're outside for three hours. If you can make it through that, then you belong in our program. If not, then one of the, one of my teachers, one of my toddler teachers came to me the other day and was like, look what I found. And she's holding up a pair of down <laughs> pants, <laughs> insulated pants. And she's like, we are going to spend all morning outside. We might be in for lunch. <laughs> that is so, so awesome. impressed. That's a yeah. keeper, right? That's, That's a yeah. keeper. That's a keeper. She has come such a long way. She, when she first started with us, I didn't think she'd make it, but that girl, she's doing great. Sarah, what, what, I mean, there's been so many nuggets here that I think are amazing. And I'm hoping what you'll do is share some of those articles. Oh, I know, yeah, yeah look at yeah, the notes. Sure. Send those, email those articles to me so I can add them to the porch play chat. But one of the things that I think that you talked about that I'm not, I want to make sure we heard. I love that you do interdisciplinary degreed people. Yeah. Because they bring a specific specialty Mm -hmm. And they, they are, a, they are a valuable resource to a nature-based program because they You're are the so experts. Valuable. Yeah. You yeah. can't be the expert in all that nature stuff. Yeah. And I love the field journals. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we found, so my, uh, the teachers are, they are a huge piece of it to make sure you have that balance between a teacher with a background in education and a teacher with a background in science and pairing them up. It's just, it makes the curriculum so rich. It's amazing. You know, it's so good because I honestly can't stand outside and listen and identify all of the different birds, but I have teachers that can, yes. and I've brought in experts to, to teach us. We have this woman in Vermont called the bird diva. Her name's Bridget Butler. And she, she is, a specialist in birding. And so we had her come in for a day of in-service and teach us all about birding. 
So um, bringing in those pieces or having one of our teachers who has their background in science to come and take us on a walk and show us the, um, the different tree species and how to identify them so that we wow. all know that. So utilizing everyone's strengths so that we can have that information. And that really um, creates a fabulous team that, yeah. that, can, that has a resource bank right there in the building. Mm -hmm. and can say I don't know what this bird is can you come help us figure it out and then right. off they go Sarah yeah, this has really been fun. amazing but you can't go anywhere I'm going to close this up and okay. then I'll be I'll be right back don't hang up though I'll be okay. I'm going to close this up but I'll be right back <laughs> to learn more about IPA USA or to join IPA USA please visit our website at ipausa.org and until next time thanks for listening and keep on playing.